Yes? Aha! We have no questions from the audience. <laughs> Let's start. But he's in the building. We don't know. I think they so big. I'm, just, I'm assuming it is not. No. All right. If he arrives, we should all welcome him. Yeah. 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 Do you mind going under this? I have no objection whatsoever to doing anything that you would like to do. <laughs> you know, when you are the host, actually. <laughs> That's quite all right. I have to ask your permission. I can do that right at the yeah, yeah, but they'll leave it open. He might send we, it to another. Yeah, and but we can call on him. Yeah, yeah let's call on him afterwards. Let's not yeah. invite him up to sit at the front because then if Kushner comes in, we, we have to call Just give me his name. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, and how wonderful it is to see a big, full house. I hope we're going to have a very lively discussion, thought-provoking, which will reach some decent conclusions. We are here to discuss migration. Excuse me, sir. Do you recall from the plenary this morning what President Tong of Kiribati said? We must migrate with dignity and with confidence. Dignity and confidence. Is that a pipe dream, ladies and gentlemen? He says it's going to be a reality. Let's see if in the course of the next hour and a half, we can see where we're going to get to with that. What are the tensions behind that? Is it just so much smoke and mirrors. Joining us today, indeed the sponsors for today's discussion, are UNHCR, and we are very pleased to welcome the Deputy UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Craig Johnston. Mr. Johnston. Thank you. Sitting next to him is Njoro Njaye, Deputy Director General of the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, who knows more about this subject than anyone else in the room, I dare say. <laughs> And along from Njoro is Walter Kalin, Special Representative of the UN Secretary General for the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons. And we will be discussing rights a great deal. How do we safeguard the rights of a whole new category of people, these climate refugees, if you like? You will notice that there is an empty seat over there, and I am not going to take that seat. It's meant for the French Foreign Minister, Bernard Kouchner, who may or may not join us. We will have to pray to the gods that he does. If he doesn't, though, we shall make it a lively discussion nevertheless. We are here by invitation 
of UNHCR, who is sponsoring this discussion of ours. And so I am going to ask Craig Johnson, without further ado, to kick us off and answer some of the key questions facing us at the moment to do with migration and displacement. Craig. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the introduction, and we'll see how far we get in the way of answers. I think answers is what we're very short of. I tell you what we're not short of. We're not short of exhortation. And I have been through a number of sessions today in which people are exhorting uh, more action, but exhortation doesn't get you where you want to go. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, I will not uh, infringe upon your time any further with respect to exhortation, nor am I going to stress to you the severity of the problem, the reality of the problem, because I think you are an audience of the converted, and I don't need to stress at great length just how severe this problem is. I might say a word or two about urgency, because I think it is absolutely imperative that we understand that this is not a problem of the future. This is a problem that is upon us now and is going to grow in intensity over the course of the next few years. So it's something that we have to deal with now. This isn't something where we can just speculate about what might happen in the future. We must do that as well. But we also have to deal with the reality of today's events and the growing reality of what is going to happen to us over the course of the future. So what I'm more interested in is actually, and maybe that comes from the fact that ours is an operational agency, I'm interested in what we are going to do about the problem. What is the action plan for dealing with this issue, not simply talking about how severe the problem actually is. And I'd like to propose to you in my given five minutes that we focus first and foremost on what is going to happen in Copenhagen. Now, I think that those of us here who are concerned primarily with the humanitarian consequences of climate change need to acknowledge that the principal objective of Copenhagen needs to be to, to end the problem at its source. That is to say, to deal with the issue of carbon emissions, to limit the damage being done by climate change. We can't prevent the damage entirely, but we can certainly limit that damage if the world rises to the occasion, and that really has to be the primary objective of Copenhagen. But let's face the reality, and I think we did face the reality in Bali, and that is that it is too late to solve all of the consequences of climate change. We also need to have a secondary objective. And in fact, Copenhagen will be a failure if we don't address the secondary objective, which is the strategy of adaptation. We need to have a mechanism for funding adaptation. We need to have a strategy on adaptation. We need to set us a series of events in place that will make it possible for the countries that are likely to be most affected to be able to cope with this issue as it springs upon them over the course of the next few years. I would add to that, then, a third category that needs to be addressed, and that is disaster response. You can consider disaster response to be a part of adaptation, perhaps, but it has some materially different characteristics to it. And I would argue that it deserves attention in its own right. Just as it took a long time for the climate change people to come to the understanding and the recognition that we needed to have adaptation, so too I think it has been difficult for the people in adaptation to accept the fact that we were not going to be successful in all of our adaptation strategies and that we will have disasters. And we are going to have to learn how to cope with those disasters in the best possible way in order to mitigate their consequences. Even if we were to take every conceivable step today in terms of adaptation, we are still not going to cover all of the bases. We cannot, we will never be able to raise the financial uh, capability to adapt to every possible circumstance that could occur at every possible place around the world. I look to example, to the recent example in New Orleans. The United States government is right now in the process of building for New Orleans a safeguard system to prevent against a further calamity there. Have they covered it for every possible contingency? It would be impossibly expensive to do so. 